We want to thank you so much for tuning in to our Bible class as we continue our series on Destruct uh, Christianity. Uh, hopefully you'll be blessed on the message tonight. Let us begin uh, with prayer. Holy and righteous Father, be with us, Father, as we study your word. Bless us, dear Father, with understanding, with clarity. And we pray, dear Father, that we will have a clearer picture of your assignment for us. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Please turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Uh, for the last two weeks, we've been dealing with uh, man up. We've been dealing with the man's view uh, of the church. And so one of the things that we have to understand in the body of Christ is that all of our men should be aspiring uh, to reflect the image of God. That's not only important for our men to understand, that's also important for our women to understand. Because anytime that you see a man that is not operating in the vision of God, it should be your responsibility or maybe just the love in your heart for you to be able to reach out to our young boys, our teenagers, our men to be able to say, hey, listen, you know God made you to reflect him. God did not make you so that you can reflect the foolishness of the world. So it's important for us and it's imperative uh, that we have a, a right understanding of how our men are not only supposed to reflect God, but also uh, are, are meant to lead. And so uh, today, on tonight, uh, we want to be able to uh, talk about and to discuss the role of women in the church. We want to be able to talk about the role of women in the church so that there can be a proper understanding uh, and clarity on how we're supposed to work together. We're not talking about men just to be talking about men, and we're not talking about women just to be talking about women. We're, we're talking about these subjects in view of the church so that we can see how they work together. And so here we are in Genesis chapter 2. Just as we started with the men, uh, we would also have to start uh, with the women in this perspective. In Genesis chapter 2, in beginning at verse 18, and the Bible says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. One of the things that God said, God uh, created the world and he created man. He went to the dust of the earth and when he went to the dust of the earth, the Bible says he breathed into man uh, his spirit. Man became a living soul and the purpose and the reason he created man is so that man can reflect God and that man can have dominion and that men can lead. With that, uh, God placed Adam in the Garden of Eden. And in the Garden of Eden, uh, Adam did not have to mow the grass. Um, Adam did not have to wash dishes. Adam did not uh, have to worry about what he should eat or, or where he was going to sleep. God literally provided everything that Adam needed. And so... Uh, when God was looking in Genesis chapter 2, when God was looking at Adam, he, he was not looking at a man that was malnutrition. Sometimes when you can look at a man, you say, oh, man, it's not good for you to be alone. And the reason you say that is because he smells, he's not washing right, uh, he, he needs to eat, he looks malnutrition, he looks sickly, uh, he looks disorganized. And the view of the world uh, with a man without a woman is that a man can't function without a woman. Uh, and that's not the view that we get from scriptures. Sometimes we, we need to make sure that we have a proper view uh, of men and women from the scriptures and not uh, from the world's view. Uh, some of the images that you see uh, uh, about men is that men are stumbling around and they're goofy and they're making a whole bunch of mistakes. And it's the woman that says, ah, you can't live without me. And she comes in. And that's not the image that God has of a man, that he's fumbling around and he don't know uh, where his right foot is versus his left foot. Matter of fact, when God, in Genesis chapter 2, when God looked at Adam, Adam was taking care of his business. I need you to understand something about Adam in Genesis chapter 2. Adam was not complaining. Uh, Adam was not murmuring against God. Adam was taking care of his business. The Bible did not say that Adam was depressed. Uh, so the reason for a woman is not because uh, the man is depressed and he's lost and he don't know where to go and he don't, he don't know where to find the fruit in the Garden of Eden, so he needs a guide. That was not what God was looking at in Genesis chapter 2. God was looking at a man 
who was well taken care of because the reason why the man in Genesis chapter 2 was well taken care of because that man had a father and his father was God. So, so God had provided for Adam. God had taken care of Adam. God had given strength to Adam. Adam at that time was reflecting the image of God and God looked at him and he, after he created him, he even said, it's good. But then in Genesis chapter 2, he looks and says, but it's not good. Not not that he was making mistakes. Matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 2, Adam had not made any mistakes. So it's not like he needed a tutor. It's it's not like he needed somebody uh, to help him uh, uh, wash his face and get his life together. God was not sending Adam a life coach. Why am you saying this, Brother Williams? Because it's very important for a woman to understand her purpose is that a woman's purpose is not to put a man together. A woman's purpose is not to make sure that the man doesn't make any mistakes. The purpose of the woman is not to make sure uh, that the man uh, knows how to function. That's not the role. Matter of fact, who's responsible for a man being able to operate uh, in his vision? That is the responsibility of God and man, which is why this is extremely important. It's important for a man to have his own relationship with God. And if a man does not have his own relationship with God, then it's not the responsibility of the woman to substitute God. That's extremely important. It is not the woman's responsibility to be a substitute teacher for God uh, because the man was skipping out on class. So you're not, as a woman, you're not supposed to make house calls trying to be God for a man who refuses to have a relationship with his father. So it's important for every man to have a relationship with God. uh, And so, but it's not the responsibility of the woman to substitute that. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 13, he says, it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for man to be alone. And that statement is not based on dysfunction. It's not good for man to be alone. That statement is based upon what God sees in the future. And so what God is about to do, it's already good what he sees. But what God is about to do is God is about to upgrade and improve on what he has already done. Now here's something that's very clear. God does not make anything that's dysfunctional. So when God made Adam and made the world and made the garden and put the trees and set the temperature just right, set the four rivers in the garden of Eden just right, slayed everything, no predators, no death. God made, even the mosquitoes got along. Everything that God made was good. But what I'm about to do, I'm about to improve on what I have just done, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to make something for him. So a a woman has to understand this. A woman is made. We're taking this in the view of the church. A woman is made, and she's made for a purpose. She's not made to be anybody's God. She's not made to fix any man. She's not made to substitute or to try to retrain. She was not sent to Adam to train him. So that's not why God made you. God did not make you to train anybody. When God made the woman, he made the woman to be a helpmeet. The word helpmeet means someone who is suitable, someone who will partner, someone who will help with the load. Now, I, I need you to be, uh, this to be very clear also. In the Garden of Eden, the only responsibility that Adam had was to dress and keep the garden. The Bible never says he was failing on his job. But when God made the woman, the dressing and the keeping of the garden, now she was going to partner with him. She was not going, she was not being made to take it over. 
The Bible also let us know that there is no sin. Uh, there is no sin at this time. And so because there is no sin uh, at this time, uh, he is not over her and she is not under him. He made the woman. Notice the original design of God. God made the woman not so that man can just rule over. He made her to be a partner. Somebody says, well, Brother Williams, I'm not interested in a relationship. Uh, this, this, I think you're talking about marriage. No, no, no. I'm talking about how the church should operate and how the men and the women that we need to sit back down and make sure we have a clear understanding of our relationship with one another because we might be outside of the design of God that the women of the church uh, and their role and their purpose cannot come from the world. It has to come from the vision of God of why he even made the woman. Men need to be reconnected with God so that men can understand why we're here. Because if a man understands his role and a woman understands his role, then the church can go to another level. We have men that's poking out their chest trying to be something in the church that they can't be at home. And sometimes you have women operating in the church outside of the design of God and God says, I can't bless that mess. But what if we set back down and understand the true image and vision of God so that we could actually learn how this thing is supposed to work? God didn't make women to bring into the church so that they can fix the men. It's not your job to fix the men. And it's not the man's job uh, 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 to uh, dominate the woman. That's no scripture that says men are supposed to dominate the women. Then, then how are we supposed to work together? Because that's how it's supposed to be. The church is made of two genders. The church is made of two genders, and we have to get connected with God to find out how this thing works. There's nothing like a car that's driving beautifully and it's humming because all of the parts are working together. All of the, the engine, uh, the, the, uh, the, the tires, the body, the frame, uh, all of the nuts uh, and bolts of the, all of this is working together. That's how we should be. Sometimes when you hear a car knocking, it's because something is broken. Maybe all of the chatter and the noise we hear in the church is because something's broken. And it's not because God ha have not laid out the blueprint. Maybe we're not reading the blueprint. And we're trying to operate like a truck when you're a car. And you're trying to tow things when you're only supposed to be a passenger vehicle. We're operating outside of design. So he says, listen, uh, in verse 18, he says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a help meet for, uh, a help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God uh, formed every beast of the field. Now, I, I want to make that connection between verse 18 and 19. How God made the woman is not the same way that God made the man. How God made the woman is not the same way that God made man. When God made man, he came from the dust of the earth, he formed man, and he breathed into man. Women were made differently. If you understand that, never expect a man to think like a woman and never expect a woman to think like a man. I'm not supposed to think like a woman. I'm not supposed to feel like a woman. I'm not supposed, I, I am a man. I'm not supposed to operate the way that women operate. Operate. I'm not supposed to share my feelings like women. Matter of fact, when you see me operating in a certain way, you should say, hey, that's how a man is supposed to operate because a man operates differently than a, a woman. We operate differently because we are made differently. And all of that's extremely important. So when God made the woman, he put the man to sleep. Because I'm going I'm to I'm send you some help, and I'm going to send you someone that is suitable. Notice what God did. I'm not just sending you a woman. I'm sending someone that is suitable, that matches you. Every woman does not match a man. Uh, and so what God did is God made the match. He didn't find a match. God made a match, and then he connected. So he put the man to sleep, and when he put the man to sleep, he went inside of man. Now, here's what's important. What is supposed to be inside of the man? When God made man, 
and he breathed his spirit into man, the man was supposed to reflect the image of God. God put man to sleep and then he went inside of man and when he went inside of man, he pulled out that rib and then he made the woman uh, out of that, which means that when, a, when men and women of the Lord's church come together, we should reflect the full essence of God. If the church is only full of women, you're, you're not reflecting the full image of God. When a church is made up of only men, you're not reflecting the full image of God. When you have a predominantly white congregation and you have no other races or culture in that, they're reflecting only a partial image of God. When you have a predominantly black congregation uh, and you have uh, no other races or all the culture in there, it, uh, it can be a wonderful church, but it is not reflecting uh, the the full essence of God. It is only when men and women uh, of all races and people come together that the world is able to really see the full essence of God. And so if, if our men and our women don't get along, then the world will never be able to see what the church really looks like because God made man and man was supposed to reflect the full image of God. God reached inside that image, pulled it out, and made woman out of that as well so that when they came together, God can still see himself uh, in man and in woman. They were not supposed to be separated in, in the Garden of Eden. They were actually supposed to work together so that the image of God is not divided, that the image of God is actually complete and full because we have learned. That's why we should always be endeavoring, endeavoring as Ephesians says, uh, to, to, for unity. We should always be endeavoring to, to, to be one in Christ. Why? Because in division, we are not reflecting the image of God. So God made women differently than a man, which means that a man is, uh, and, and a man and a woman, how they operate should not be the same because the role of the woman is not the role of the man. He made her based upon the role she was supposed to operate in. So that's why it's strange when a woman operates like a man. That's confusing. That's, that's actually demonic because God did not make you to look like, talk like, and operate and think like a man. If God wanted a, a woman to think like a man, he would have made you into a man. Matter of fact, there would have been no reason to make a woman if God just wanted another man uh, to be. But what God wanted is that God wanted man uh, to improve and God wanted man to have a partner and so in order for a man to have a partner, he did not make a, uh, another man uh, because that would be uh, uh, against God's uh, vision. When God looked at man and said he needed some help, he did not think to go find another man. It is illegal for a man when he's looking for a partner to go find another man to partner with because he's not operating in the vision of God and that the vision of God is in him and he's reflecting the image of God, he will look at things the way God looks at things. And so when a man decides that he wants to be in a relationship, he's not going to go look for another man. He's going to go look for what God looks for and God made a woman to be suitable for him. So it's important for us to be able to understand uh, that, un that vision of God for women. And if we can have that understanding in the church, maybe we can get back to kingdom business as we move further on. I want to talk about some warnings that the Bible gives to women. And all of this is in view of the church. We're not just discussing women to be discussing women. We're discussing men, we're discussing women so that we can have a proper view of how we're supposed to operate in the Lord's church. In Proverbs chapter 24, in Proverbs chapter 24, in uh, verse 3, through wisdom is a house builded, and by understanding it is established. Verse 4, and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. 
Um, so the Bible talks about this house. The Bible talks about this house. Uh, and in Proverbs, it says a house is built. A house is built by, by wisdom. Um, the Bible says that, that a man is supposed to lead in his house. Whether, whether he's good or not. If you're a man and you have a house, you're supposed to lead in the house. You're supposed to, be, you're supposed to lead in the house. But when the Bible refers to, to women, it's, it's the woman that helps to build it. Uh, it's, it's the woman that helps to build it. Uh, the man leads. The, the, the man leads. And, and the, the, the woman makes it stronger or she can make it weaker. In, in Proverbs uh, 24, it says that by wisdom, a house is built. So one of the things that our sisters need to know, not only for your personal house, but also for the local congregation in which you attend, what's important for our sisters to know that our men are supposed to lead, but it is the women of the church that will either build it up or they can tear it down. Somebody says, Brother Williams, uh, as a woman, how do I help to build? The Bible says by wisdom. Wisdom is the insight into the nature of a thing. The wisdom is the ability to apply what you see. So the Bible says by wisdom, our sisters, matter of fact, the Bible says that wisdom is the principal thing. Our sisters should be, a lot, I love our sisters like to read uh, Proverbs chapter 31, which is really a book of wisdom, a chapter of wisdom. Why is it good for our sisters to indulge in wisdom? Because if you are ignorant, you'll end up making some decisions that cause harm to the house and you won't build. Our sisters should be builders, not demolitionists. Our sisters should be building up. And the Bible says, how do you do that? You, you don't build a house. You, you, you don't build a house uh, e even for your own personal home, uh, for, for wherever you live, for your own personal home. A, a woman does not build her home. According to the scriptures, a, a woman does not build her home uh, by how affectionate she is. A woman, a woman can be real affectionate. A woman, a woman can, can give a thousand kisses. And she says, every, every time my family, my children, my husband or whatever, they come home, I'm, I'm kissing, I'm hugging her. But that's not the way the Bible says you build a house. It's, it's not about how much money you can bring into that. That's not how you build a house. The Bible says you build a house by wisdom. Wisdom is a way in which you think. And it's about applying and, and how you apply that information. The opposite of wisdom is foolish, which means a foolish woman, she makes decisions that actually undercuts the, the leader in her home or she undercuts the strength of her house. So she does certain things that causes distrust. She does certain things uh, that causes confusion. Uh, she does certain things uh, she's, uh, that causes contention. And, and, and when you walk in her house, you don't walk in and, and feel the peace and feel the love. When you walk in, it's tense. Uh, it seems angry. Everybody seems frustrated. Uh, and then you look and say, okay, well, he's leading the house, but who's building this house? Because it, it doesn't feel like a home. There are some men, they drive round and round and round and round and round and round. There are so many men right now, they sitting in parking lots right now. They off of work, but they sitting in parking lots right now. Why? Because they say, ah, I'm, I'm, I'm leading my family. I'm providing. I'm doing those things. that, But I just don't want to go to the house because the way that that house is being constructed is not by wisdom. Let's look further in the text. Through wisdom is a house builded. And then it says, by understanding, it is established. And then it says, and by knowledge, the house is filled. Uh, so we already talked about wisdom. And then, and then the Bible talks uh, about understanding. 
And, and so understanding uh, is extremely important because understanding is the ability to comprehend. That there are some, there are some women you tell certain things to and they just don't get it. Somebody says, well, women ain't the only, there are men, there are men that don't have understanding. Two wrongs, Eddie Kane said two wrongs don't make a right. So, you know, just because men don't have understanding, that doesn't mean you sh everyone should get a pass. So, so with that, a woman that does not have understanding, a woman that does not have the ability to comprehend, a woman does not, that does not have the ability to be able to step back and be wise and check the scene. A, a lot of our churches are in tur turmoil because we don't know how to get along with one another and our sisters are fighting with one another because we don't have enough mature women uh, to be able to step in with wisdom and to be able to see how uh, to approach certain things and you see this and you see that and she does not comprehend that the comment that she's about to make is actually about to make the situation worse and you'll hear some Sometimes you'll hear some woman say, well, listen, I'm just trying to tell you the truth. Yeah, but your comments are not wise. Your words don't build. Well, he need to, he just need to, he need to get another job because this is not, okay, your tone and your speech, everything you, you're saying might be true, but you're not building anything. Matter of fact, by your comments, you're chopping and, and attacking his ego. You're the brothers at these church, uh, these, oh, what kind of elders do we have? What kind of deacon, what kind of leaders do we have? That preacher don't know what he's talking about. Your words, your words, how, how you're approaching it. All of the women that you're bringing together and you're pouring poison uh, into them. You're not building the church. You're tearing it down. You're tearing it down. If the brothers are trying to lead, and even if they're not doing a good job, matter of fact, you can put a, you can put a, uh, a below average brother in leadership, but you surround him around wise and understanding women, that brother will walk around and he will operate like a boss. He will operate like he, he's the best leader in the world and it won't really be him because he'll turn around and realize it's because of the support system that I have. Matter of fact, you can have a half decent preacher, but you surround him around strong, spiritual, uh, uh, like-minded sisters who are in tune with God and are not carnal and they're wise and they're understanding they will build that preacher up to be better than he could not have been by himself. Wisdom and understanding helps to build the house. If our sisters get together and say, hey, listen, this is the leadership that God has allowed us to have. These are the brothers that God has allowed us to have. There are so many women that are frustrated in churches because they, they say, what uh, can we do uh, because we're, they feel stuck? Wisdom. Sometimes you got to step back and you got you to gotta be able to plan. You got to be able to look to help to build the house. You, you want your local congregation and church to grow, but it seems like the brothers at your local congregation won't let you do anything. I want to say this, and, and, and I want this to be very clear. I've heard all across the country, I've heard sisters say, we want to do more in the Lord's church, but we don't know... Um, they say, they say, we want to do more in the Lord's church, but we don't know what to do. This is a side note. You don't need permission to go visit the sick. You don't need elders' approval to go to the prisons. You, you, don't, you don't need leadership's approval to hold Bible classes in your home with your coworkers and with your neighbors. You, you know what you don't need? You, you don't need leadership's permission to make lunches to give to those who are hungry. You don't need permission to go visit the homeless. Do you know that? God does not require for you to fill out a permission slip so that you can give a cup of cold water. Matter of fact, Jesus says this. He says, when I was hungry and I was thirsty uh, and I was naked and I was in prison, you visited me. And they said, when did we do those things? He said, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. Do you know that a lot of our women are inactive in the church because they're, they're waiting on permission slips that don't exist? They're waiting on, they're waiting on signatures that God never required? 
Do you know that if you're a brother or a sister in Christ, you don't have to be the preacher to go visit the sick. You don't have to be the preacher to go to the prisons. Do you know how many people we have in prison? You should, you should join for the prison ministry. There are people being shipped in every day that need to hear the gospel, and you have the opportunity to be able to share that information with them. It is not a sin for a woman to turn to her neighbor and say, have you heard about Jesus, how he died, buried? and that he rose again. That's biblical to do. And so there are so many, many do, you, do you know how many programs are needed in your community? And do you know it takes nothing for maybe one or two sisters to get together and say, hey, listen, let's go talk to the city and let's see if we can put a program together so that we can be able to give some clothes uh, and some food to some of the children uh, who are maybe less fortunate and are not able to operate uh, like they should. Actually, if you take a step back and you start surveying your community and the needs, and sometimes if you would just take the time and stop gossiping or, or take the time to stop being distracted and doing prayer request time, and when people start giving their prayer requests, that can be your ministry. Matter of fact, if you just listen, how many people get up and say, listen, I got surgery. I got, I, I got surgery on Tuesday, and, and my father's sick, and there's somebody who stood up and said, I got laid off. If you would actually take the time to sit and listen, that's your ministry right there. Matter of fact, as soon as worship is over, you take your pad and your pen, you take your, uh, your tablet or whatever, and you can go out and reach to the person who just stood up and announced to everybody, I'm in need. That's your ministry right there. Matter of fact, sometimes God is showing you what you can do. Sometimes you're lacking the wisdom and the understanding to be able to comprehend what God is actually throwing in your face. All those people who come to you and they're, they're, they're needing your help and you're, and, and you're still disgruntled because you're so focused on worship service that God wants you to get involved in ministry and ministry is through the week. Ministry is not a service. So, so sometimes when there are some women who say, I want to do more in the Lord's house, what they're really saying is, I want to do more doing an uh, uh, hour and a half or two hour worship service. When God says, hey, listen, I actually got something greater for you, but it won't be in the building. And, and it, it won't be in the building. Because listen, only so many people can do certain things during worship. Everybody can't do everything. But if we really want to make an impact and if your heart is really pure about serving in the kingdom, not, not, not just in the church building, if your heart is really sincere about serving in the kingdom, you'll be focused on when, when they say amen, your ministry begins. And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. By wisdom... A woman needs wisdom, a woman needs understanding, but the Bible says also a woman needs knowledge. A woman that refuses to learn, and she thinks she knows it all. I've been here long enough, and I, a woman who refuses to open up her mind to be able to receive information and knowledge, because if you're not willing to grow, that means you've already plateaued. If you get connected to men who are growing, you will stunt their growth and you will poison the house. You will prevent the men from moving forward uh, because you will complain because you don't like change. Our sisters who refuse to study, a, 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 a sister a woman in the church who refuses to attend Bible class, who refuses to be involved in study, who refuses to dive into the word of God is a dangerous woman because that's the one who hates knowledge. And if she hates knowledge or she rejects knowledge, she's going to try to keep her environment the same. So when the leader comes or the minister comes uh, 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 with a vision and says, hey, listen, we need to go be able to take that mountain. You're going to have several sisters in the church that we don't need to go over there. And what's over there? And the reason why you say what's over there is because you refuse to study to be able to learn and to be able to grow. See, our men are held responsible in the church to lead, but women help to build. And we need our women to be knowledgeable, not because we want them to be, because the word of God says that's how a house is built. We need them to be wise. We need them to have understanding. 
We need them to be able to, we, we, need, we need some of our sisters to be able to go in the middle of two sisters and diffuse the issue uh, and bring about love and peace uh, because she has wisdom. She has understanding. Oh, she has knowledge. And do you know that's a blessing to a leadership? That's a that's a blessing to men uh, when you have uh, men who are about God and women who also are about God and you have just wisdom running rampant in the room and you have understanding and you have knowledge. Do you know you could bring a lot more peace to your elders if I, if the women could learn more wisdom and understanding and knowledge? I'm not saying that our brothers don't need to grow as well, but sometimes. What we see in the church is that some of our men, their bar is so low, and our leadership is not what it needs to be, that our, our sisters are not challenged to grow. Because they say, well, we already are. We're already better than what we see. And I want to let you know, God is not a God that settles. That if you're truly walking after God, everybody should be challenged to be the best that they possibly can be. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 1, every wise woman builds her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. The Bible talks about this house again. And when it talks about the house, notice it references the woman, not the man. That the building of the house is something that the women, uh, 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 that our women are, uh, are, are very involved with. So the Bible says this in Proverbs 14. A woman can build a house. If she takes the principles of Jesus Christ, she can build a house. Matter of fact, when a, when, a, when a woman gets with a man, and I'm not even talking romantic. When a, when a woman, a real woman gets in the, in the presence of a man, she can make that man feel like Superman. She can build him up. Sometimes I, I've seen it. Sometimes I've seen sisters and they go to men and say, you know what, it's so good to see you this morning. You look well, and I just want you to stay in the Lord. I want you to keep fighting. I love to see you bring your family to worship. Have you ever seen some sisters in the church, and they'll walk up to certain men, and there's no flirting. There's, no, there's nothing inappropriate. That's, uh, I'm talking about a wise woman. I'm not talking about a carnal woman. I'm talking about a wise woman. She'll walk up to a man and say, you know what? You're showing yourself as a man. I love to see you bring your sons and your daughters and how you lead your wife uh, to worship. I want you to keep doing what you're doing, and that man is listening to her and, and, and the woman may only be four foot nine uh, uh, and 120 pounds but she's speaking God into that man and he's listening to her he could be a big old man he got his he got his children behind he got his wife behind and she is just pumping him up and she says you, young man you just keep doing I, I, I enjoyed the prayer all he did was pray that morning he just did open in prayer, but she came to him and said, you know what, I just enjoy the way you talk to God. I enjoy the way uh, you prayed and you keep leading. I know it may get difficult. I know it may get hard, but I need you to understand you got a lot of people and you got a lot of uh, brothers and a lot of sisters depending on you. I want you to keep fighting. And after she finished pouring into that man, that man takes his children, got his wife, and he's walking out to the car and he pumped up. I'm about to lead. I'm about to, because a woman knows how to build. A woman, women, our women should be builders. Sometimes you got brothers who are kind of timid and they don't want to serve in the Lord's house. Sometimes you need some wise women to go back and say, what you sitting back here for? You, do you know we expecting you to leave? You need to be sitting up there. Listen, God gave you a lot of gifts and we're waiting on you to use those gifts. God got something in you. Don't be, don't be timid. Don't be afraid of what God put in you. I'm praying for you, young man. That young man sitting back there, the next Sunday you come back, he up there sitting on the front row, and he looking at you saying, I'm, I'm here, I'm here. Not even realizing, you don't even realize, sisters, you help to build. Oh, you help to build. But you don't also know, know what? But you can pluck it down by your hands. 
a sister, a, 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 a group of women that don't want something to grow, they'll get together and start meeting and start talking. And they'll, matter of fact, they can influence the men to support the vision or they can influence the men to tear the vision down. Do you know how many church meetings were really started by women, but only men showed up? And it was a, it was a, it was a brother's meeting that was, I don't know if you've seen some commercials, uh, they say that this event is sponsored by, yeah, this, this event, this, this church meeting is sponsored by the women of the church. This brother's meeting is sponsored by the women of the church. And everything that went on, uh, went on in that meeting was co-signed and authored and orchestrated by our women, which you don't realize, I understand that women have a lot of influence in the church, but it's not just supposed to be women, it's supposed to be men and women and how we work together. What I'm speaking into is the power that you have that we can build up. Our men and our leaders have to have the right understanding and they have to have the right perspective, but if they do, if they can be able to match with a sisterhood who is spiritual, wise, understanding, and knowledgeable, and they understand the power and they possess, our men will lead and our women will build. Our men will lead and our women will build. Our men will go gain more territory and our women will build. And what you'll end up having is you'll have a city of God in every city because we have learned how to work together. A woman that doesn't, uh, a, a woman who's angry with her husband and she's angry at her husband, she can tear her house down by how she lives and how she operates. She want to be free and you can't tell me nothing. I, that's a foolish woman. The Bible uh, gives us a, a, a picture uh, of, of some dangers. Very quickly, turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 9. In Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 13, a foolish woman is boisterous. I'm, I'm in the text. The Bible says that a foolish woman is loud. She's, she, she talks loud. She's boisterous. Nobody can get a word in because she's going to say what she want to say, and I don't care what nobody says. I'm going I'm to say what I feel, and, you, and everybody's about to hear it because nobody's going to shut me up. The Bible says, note that person that's a foolish woman. Avoid brothers. Avoid that one. The one that's loud. Uh, uh, avoid that when uh, brother Williams why are you saying that I'm saying it because that's what the Bible is saying a boisterous is a foolish woman the Bible uh, the Bible also says a foolish woman is clamorous boisterous she is simple and knows nothing that goes back to knowledge she's a simple woman and she knows nothing she refuses to grow. She refuses to learn. She, she refuses to expand her mind. She feel like she know enough and, and, and is good enough. A woman who only focuses on her appearance and she does not focus on her mind is dangerous in the Lord's house. And she's also dangerous in a personal relationship. So the, the, there is the opposite of a foolish woman you cannot talk and listen at the same time. I want to I wanna make that clear. You cannot, you cannot always talk and listen at the same time. If you're going to learn anything, you got to stop talking so that you can listen. And so it's important for our sisters to be perceptive and to be able to listen. Now, when I say uh, loud, I, I, I don't necessarily mean silent. The Bible doesn't necessarily mean silent. So there are some men who abuse that and say, hey, you need to be quiet. Don't you say nothing. A woman has a voice because she's going to build the house. A, a woman has a, a, a voice. But it should not be loud to the point of disturbance and, and not listening and not wanting to know anything. The Bible says a foolish woman, she doesn't know anything, which means that when you talk, you don't talk intelligently. That when, when you speak, so somebody says a, a, a man should bring the table, but when a man brings the table, a woman should be able to put something on the table. Sometimes you'll have men, they'll bring the table, but a woman is empty because she didn't have anything to offer. And if the only thing that you have to offer is your outer appearance, uh, uh, every, uh, all of our sisters 
all of our churches should be striving for our sisters to have substance. So you know what? We want, we want our women to be educated. Because how are you going to build the house? We don't, we don't want our women to not be educated. Uh, it made no sense. Years ago, there were many men who would say, listen, I don't want, I, baby, you don't have to go to college. You don't have to learn anymore. What, what are you getting all them degrees for? Hey, listen, if she gets that information, the Bible says that knowledge helps to build the house. The problem is, if our men stop learning and our women keep learning, now you got friction in the church because now our sisters, when they speak, they have substance and the table that the men bring are so little, it cannot contain the substance of our women. And now that's frustrated because now we're wasting the things that God has blessed the children of God with, our sisters with. So the table has to match the substance. So if you're bringing a lot of stuff to be put on the table, that means that the table has to be large enough to contain, which is important this. Our men should be growing and our women should be growing, but it's important for our women to seek knowledge. Why? Because that's how you build the house. We don't want our women, matter of fact, and I want to be very clear, sisters, wherever you are, if you see any woman tearing down the church by her words, her actions, or her deeds, you should have enough wise and mature sisters to step in and say, no, 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 this is not how you operate in the house. We don't operate like this in the house of the Lord, and we don't operate like this in our own personal house. The Bible says the older women, this, this biblical, the older women are supposed to be able to lead and to direct and to teach the younger sisters. And sometimes it's the older sisters that are just as loud and are boisterous because we have not learned our proper roles. And many of our sisters, they may have a wonderful heart and they may love the Lord, but maybe nobody really taught them how to build. They've been in Bible classes all their lives, but nobody ever taught, nobody ever brought all of our sisters together and said, hey, does everybody in here know how to build? Now, now, here's the thing. Just because you know how to build doesn't mean, doesn't mean that men will appreciate you. But you don't lower your vision, that, that you don't lower the vision that God has for you just because men can't see it. The woman that God has intended for you to be, whether a man appreciates that or not, you be that woman. You be the woman that God has called you to be, even if the man fails to see it. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 9, in Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 9, it is better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. One of the dangers of some of our sisters, if you like fighting, you like going at other sisters, you're killing our churches. Because as the men are trying to lead, the fighting is going on at the back of the church. The Bible says what will happen if, in, in this particular text of wisdom, it is better for a man to get out of the house, climb up on the rooftop, and, and live on the rooftop than to be in the house with a brawling woman. If you're beating your husband up at home, he don't want to come to worship with you because the only time that he's going to get peace the only time that he's going to get peace in the house is when you leave for worship. Matter of fact, he don't mind you going to worship. Matter of fact, he likes dropping you off and he just say, hey, tell me when to pick you back up because my moments of peace is when you get out of this house and you go to the church house. Because if you're fighting at home, he don't want to come with you. You're not building, you're not building the house. You're, you're tearing it down. Sometimes what we don't realize, sisters, there are some sisters, not all, you're running men out of the church. You're, you're running men out of the church because, you know, they don't, they don't want to be torn down. I'm not saying this is all sisters. So some people say, I don't do that. Then this is not referring to you. But, but you know some that probably do. They're always critical. They always got something to say. They're negative. Matter of fact, sometimes you'll have some sisters that say, hey, listen, I don't really fool with other women like that. How, if you if you're a woman and you don't deal with other women like that, how you think some men will feel? I'm not going to that church. 
I don't want to be around all them women and all that cackling. And sometimes so what, what ends up happening is our leaders, some leaders are ran out of the church. Do you know how many preachers have been run out of the church? Not by other brothers, but by other sisters. So that church is always looking for a preacher. That church is always looking for a preacher because it takes a strong man to get in there. And so uh, if, you, if you have a church full of sisters who do not have the spirit of Christ in them and do not understand their vision, they end up abusing the preacher's wife and they end up running the preacher out. Uh, and, and you have families that are, have been bruised and hurt by comments. And sometimes what it takes, it's going to take strong sisters to be able to stand up and say, we got to stop this foolishness because we're not building. We're tearing this house down and God is not going to bless it. Because God will not bless mess. In Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 11. She is loud and stubborn and her feet abide not in her house. She is loud, she is stubborn, and her feet abide not in her house. Her heart is somewhere else. Her attention is somewhere else. She is contentious. She wants to fight. She doesn't listen. She wants to do her own thing. That's what tears down the house. In Ephesians chapter 5, when we get ready to close, in Ephesians chapter 5, the scripture gives a picture of a husband and a wife. And it says that the husband is supposed to submit unto the wife and the wife is supposed to submit unto the husband. They're both supposed to submit unto each other unto the Lord. The Bible says that the man is the head of the house and, and that the husband is supposed to lead and that the wife is supposed to be in subjection un, unto the husband. At the end of Ephesians chapter 5 it says I'm really not talking about the church. I'm really not talking about marriage. I'm talking about the church. And what he's saying is, this is how the church operates. So, so I want you to see this picture and the lesson be yours. The church, the church's leader, the church's husband is Jesus. Now, here's what Jesus does. Jesus provides, think about this, Jesus, Jesus provides, Jesus watches over us, Jesus protects Jesus leads us. What is the church's responsibility, even in the 21st century? What is the church's responsibility? We're supposed to love one another in, in this house. We're, we're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to watch over one another. We're supposed to take care of one another. Uh, when somebody's sick, when somebody's in need, when somebody needs to hear the gospel, we're supposed to go out into the world and we're supposed to bring people in. We're supposed to bring people in. And when we bring them in, we're supposed to teach them and help them to be a disciple of Christ. And they're supposed to grow and they're supposed to develop. That's, that's our job. That's, that's our job. What is Jesus' job? He died for the church. He built the church. Uh, the Bible says that he uh, provides for the church. He gives us the things that he needs. He defends us. He fights for us. He's our buckler. Jesus is so many. Matter of fact, we would not be able to do the things we, that we are able to do uh, if it was not for his love that he has shown us. But do you know it's our responsibility to hold Bible classes? It's our responsibility to love one another? If anybody gets angry and they leave the church, they can't blame Jesus. It was us. It's the wife. Do you know the church is the wife of Christ? And by our attitude and by our spirit and how we operate as a church, we will either run people away or we will draw them near. I believe it was Gandhi who says, I like Jesus. I just don't like his Christians. I just don't like I don't like the people who follow him. He's talking, Gundy was talking about the wife. He, he, was talking, he was talking about the wife. So a woman, in Ephesians chapter 5, a, a, a wife is supposed to submit herself unto the husband. The husband is supposed to lead, but it's the wife that builds the house. It's the wife that builds the house. The woman's role in the church is not a role that sits there in the corner and you don't see who she is and she is. Matter of fact, 
We need the woman so that she can fulfill the full image of God when men and women come together. And when they come together, the men are supposed to lead. So men are supposed to model themselves like Christ. And the women of the church are supposed to model themselves like the church. The state of our churches right now are a reflection of two things. Are the men reflecting the example of Christ? And are the women modeling themselves after the vision of the church? And that's how men and women are supposed to work together. If, if men and women in the church really are able to come together and work together, the people in the community will be able to see Jesus and they'll be able to love the church at the same time because they'll say, I see it. Or they'll say, oh, I see it. And they're gonna wanna be a part of it. When they come into our fellowship, when people come into the church, they'll say, oh, this is beautiful because I see the men and I see Jesus. And I look at the women and I see the beauty of the church. What is the church supposed to be? The church is supposed to be forgiving. The, the church is supposed to teach. The, per the church is supposed to stand for truth. The church is supposed to be understanding. The church is supposed to be loving. The church is supposed to be a wonderful place. Have you ever heard anybody say, I thought the church was supposed to be better than that? It's, it's a reflection. If a church operates bad, that's not a reflection on how bad Jesus is. That means we got work to do because the Lord is trying to remove every spot and wrinkle from us. Our sisters have to get together and say, hey, listen, it's our job to help build. And when I mean build, I'm not talking about just decorate or that. I'm, I'm talking spiritually build. If we have that proper view and all hands are on deck, watch the Lord's church explode. I pray you be blessed. Thank you so much for tuning in to the message, and we pray that you are blessed. We want you to be able to like, share, and subscribe, and be able to give this information to someone that you love. Also, we want to thank all of our partners who have deposited into this ministry. Because of you, we are able to share this message all over the world. If you would like to partner with us, there are several opportunities and ways in which you will be able to do that, in which you can be able to be a blessing unto this ministry, and we can be able to connect with you. We want to thank you so much, and we pray that you continue to tune in week in and week out uh, and be able to be a blessing unto us as hopefully we're a blessing unto you. North Colony Church of Christ, we're here to heal, help, and restore.